introduce uh, you to our latest uh, member of IPPE, Professor Jackie Eccles. As you know, she is the mother of numerous theories, an expert in all things um, about self and interest, um, an expert on most things you can think of really, but what you don't know is that she's got the best fish and turtle pond I've ever seen in my entire life. It's awesome. And I've got to show you at one of the staff morning teas, I'll bring you a film clip and you can have a look at it. It, it is brilliant. It is so inspiring. So I'm incredibly worried about showing you my turtle pond. For any of you that have seen mine at dinner, you know, like a, a tank. So, you know, my turtle pond, fish pond self-concept is falling remarkably. So you might need help in giving me a bit of assurance about that. But please um, join me in welcome Jackie. We're delighted to have you here, Jackie. <laughs> something that's different than, if, if you're familiar with my work, you probably are not, you're less familiar with this line of work that we've been doing for the last uh, 10 years because I'm not very good at getting things published or getting things out written up. Um, I'm, and I'm talking about this work because I'm hoping it has some relevance to some of the work that you all are doing on, on, on Aboriginal youth. Um, and so uh, let me just take you through it uh, and I can take questions along the way, that's fine. I don't have any I need to get to the end of it, so I would love to have conversation, you know, as we go. So my goal today is I want to look at social group memberships. I've gotten very interested in social group memberships. I was always interested in gender, but I've now gotten more interested broadly in, in social group membership and what, how that gets under the skin. Um, so I'm interested in thinking about it as a broader social context for development and identity formation. And I'm in particular interested in those characteristics, those social categories that uh, have stigma attached to them. And so there's evidence that they're linked to uh, differential treatment in the world that the kids are growing up. And African American uh, youth in the United States is certainly an example of that abuse, youth that experience discrimination based on their social group membership uh, throughout, their, uh, throughout their lives. And uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about that, and then I'm going to present some data that we've been gathering on the topic. So I want you to think about race and ethnic identity as both a personal and a social identity. Um, and I'll say more about that in a minute. I want you to think about it as an experience of racism. So when I use the term race, I'm not meaning biological race. I'm really meaning racism, or, or what it is to live in a world that is racist. And I try to think about how these two aspects interrelate to help us understand many things, but today I'll talk about school achievement. Now, what do I mean about the distinction between social uh, and, and personal identities? Now, the distinction I'm making is that social identities help us belong. Personal identities make us stand out. So if you could sort of think about it as fitting in and standing out. So social identities are those identities that help us feel like we're part of a group. Personal identities are those things that make us feel like we're unique. Um, and when Erickson talks about identity, he's talking pretty much about personal identity rather than social identity. So, uh, as I said, this is part of the person's um, the, 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 an indiv the part of the person's self-concept that derives from their knowledge of and attitudes towards members in a social group, coupled with the value and emotional significance attached to that membership. So as kids are growing up, they learn a lot about social categories. They learn about the stereotypes associated with categories. I don't think that's identity. I think it, it only rises to identity when it becomes very important to the person's self-concepts. So it becomes part of their core. Social identity is the part of the collective self that defines the individual in terms of their shared similarities with members of the group that they are identifying with. So that they share things in common with other members of that group. Um, it's also, as I said, a function of relatedness and membership. And it, it includes, it can, I mean, you can have a social membership, you can have a social identity for the very same things that you have a personal identity. So I'll give you an example of that. So for example, um, when I think about Jock, 
you know all you, you, you all know the term jocks, right? Mm -hmm. So one can have a social identity as a jock, and those are the people who run around wearing the appropriate clothes. Um, it's a big deal for them to be identified with being a jock. Um, you could also have a personal identity as an athlete, and in, in fact, totally askew the social identity of being a jock. Your being an athlete is something that you think is, is relevant to you, makes you different, and you probably aren't going to be wearing all those clothes. In fact, you may go out of your way to show that you aren't like the jocks. Okay, so the, the function of these identities, I, the difference between these identities, social and personal identities, have to do with the meaning of the identity to the individual. Okay, now, I'm a developmentalist, and so what I'm interested in, too, is how these social identities vary over time and context. So we have many identities, and a given identity will be salient, more or less salient than other identities over different periods of our lives and over different periods of the day. So right now, you are all behaving appropriately for an audience identity as, a, as, a, as an academic. When you go to the bar tonight, you won't have that identity, and that won't be particularly salient to you. So I don't see these things as being uh, omnipresent or omnisalient. They are responsive to the situation in which you're operating. And we could imagine a whole set of studies that would be looking at sort of what cues an individual to make this identity salient versus a different identity. Now, personal identities, in contrast, are those things that I said make, make a person feel like they're unique. Um, and much of my work and work on the self actually focuses on what I'm putting under the category of identity. But, but many of the things that where we have knowledge of ourselves, so self-concepts, again, will not necessarily rise to the category of a, of a personal identity. In order for it to be a personal identity, it has to be a key part of yourself. So you could have very good, you know, you could, you could know lots of things about yourself and have self-concepts and attitudes towards yourself in lots of different areas, but they wouldn't necessarily be part of your personal identity if they're not part of what's core to who you are. Uh, so two that are critical within expectancy value theory, which is more similar to what you all would do, would be ability self-concept, which would be the me self, and values, goals, aspirations, and possible selves. So it's another literature that sort of taps upon this idea of personal identities. So how might social and personalities affect behavior and achievement? Um, and I'm going to argue, given that I'm coming from an expectancy value perspective, I'm going to be most interested in looking first at these self-concepts and values and goals. So essentially, I'm a boxologist, so I turn everything into boxes. <laughs> and as you can see, so I have personal identities and social identities. When I think about personal identities, I think about things like self-concept, self-schema, future possible selves, values, goals, aspirations. When I think about social identities, I think about things like the salience of the identity, the content of the identity, and the perceptions of the barriers and opportunities that are linked to category mem membership. And I think all of these characteristics are going to affect behavior um, and choices through their impact on, uh, most proximately, their impact on expectancies for, your, for yourself, uh, performance expectancies, virtual efficacy, and your perceived value of wearing option, various options. I think all of these are influenced by a whole variety of experiences that one has from point of birth online. Now, let me give you a quote from Erickson to sort of give you a richer sense of what I mean by this. So Erickson said, in discussing identity, we cannot separate personal growth and communal change, nor can we separate the identity crisis in individual life and contemporary crises in historical development because the two help to define each other and are truly relative to one another. In fact, the whole interplay between the psychological and the social, the developmental and the historical, for which identif identity formation is of prototypical significance, can be conceptualized as a kind of psychosocial relativity. Now, what's interesting is he said that in the 60s, and it sort of faded away, and now it's directly relevant to what we're thinking about today. He went on to say, a child has many opportunities to identify himself or herself more or less experimentally with real or fictitious people of either sex with habits, traits, occupations, and ideas. However,
However, the historical era in which he or she lives offers only a limited number of socially meaningful models for workable combinations of identity fragments. And I love the sort of notion of identity fragments that you're putting together. Their usefulness depends on the way in which they simultaneously meet the requirements of the organism's maturational state, the ego styles of synthesis, and the demands of the culture. So this notion of identity is encapsulating an individual's situated self in, this, in the historical moment and the socio-cultural moment in which they are growing. So, how could we use this kind of approach to trying to understand something like group differences in academic achievement? Um, African American students in the U.S., and I assume this could be done with other groups as well, uh, continue to do less well academically than European American youth in terms of grades, in terms of completion rates, in terms of standardized test scores, and in, ter and in terms of going on to college. What about Native Americans? Well, I, I, I think that would be true as well. I don't have data on Native Americans. I don't have data on Hispanics. I think that's true in each case, and I think this model, and I would love to see it applied to other groups. So I think this is where it would be applicable to indigenous populations here. That's just not what, that is not what we study. So I'm giving this as an example of how one could take this approach and apply it, and it could be useful in other areas as well. So what, how might we think about differences in achievement? Well, of course, the most obvious reason is in, in, inequities and in opportunities and barriers. So institutional and structural racism, um, or groupism, or sexism. Um, is, and I, I'm, I'm not talking about that, and I don't want to deny its importance. It is extremely important. Uh, but that is more the purview of sociologists. We could talk about differential face-to-face -face treatment. This is where face-to-face -face discrimination would come into roles. That gets more into the realm of what psychologists look at. And we could look at the psychological processes linked to personal and social collective identities. And, I, and there are many of these, so I'm just going to give you two is to show you an example of how we've gone about going and doing this work. The first is the notion of oppositional identity, which Fordham and Agu put forward in the United States over oh, probably about 20 years now. And basically that says, look, an individual may choose not to value and engage in those activities that are most valued by the dominant group because they don't think they will pay off for them. That's sort of the basic notion of oppositional identity. So in response, you form a different identity. You say, that's not for me. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to incorporate and take in that identity that the dominant group says is important. So Agbu talked a lot about that in terms of educational outcomes. Uh, Claude Steele then talked about stereotype threat, which is if you believe that the people in the group think you cannot achieve in a given area, you may then that may elicit anxiety anytime you're in a situation and that group membership gets brought, to, uh, it gets brought to mind and can undermine your performance. So those are sort of two different theories that have been for, had been put forward. So they're both powerful theories. The evidence for both of them is quite mixed. And I'm just going to show you how we tried to look at it. We don't find a lot of evidence for either of them. And I want to focus more of my time talking about other explanations. So, the notion of social identities also gives us a powerful tool in trying to make sense of meaning making. So this is now a third way that one can come and use, can come and look at these kinds of identities. This is much more the way that anthropologists are looking at it, the way people in various critical uh, theoretical perspectives are looking at it. But social identities give us a window onto how a person makes sense of their experiences. So they can explain other people's behavior towards them through a lens of, so, of, of social identity. And that may be helpful in buffering discrimination. That may be helpful um, in forming other kinds of, of, of ways that you could create support or, or bring movements to try to change uh, the government's responses. OK, so uh, let me go to my data. So this is a study, this is the Maryland Adolescent Development and Context Study. These are some of my collaborators. Uh, was fun. These were some of my funders. We've been doing this study now for 20 years. Uh, so the sample, we picked a county in the United States where the socioeconomic distribution 
was as close for Ameri African Americans and European Americans as possible so that we could isolate the effects of identity from the effects of income. In many, many studies, if you took just a random sample, or if you took a sample of African Americans and European Americans, they would differ dramatically in their socioeconomic uh, status. And that is extraordinarily important, but it makes it hard for you to isolate these processes, these psychological processes, because you won't be able to tell whether it's poverty, social class, or whether it's, or, or whether it's, it's race or ethnicity that are driving these, that are driving these forces. So we have 625 African American students. We picked them up in the seventh grade. Uh, they were in, they they were they, they were they were largely they were largely middle class. So you have a distribution that's that's around the middle class as opposed to a distribution that is around the lower end of the middle class. We did face-to-face in-home interviews, self-administered questionnaires, open-ended telephone interviews, and repeated intensive interviews with the subset. So I have tons and tons and tons of data. I'm only going to talk about it a little bit today. Uh, we got them in the start in the beginning of the seventh grade. That says three years after high school, we've now gone back twice, and they are in their mid-40s. And we have information all the way through their mid-40s. So study one, I just want to go back to these, uh, these ideas, and I want to go through this very quickly. These ideas link to uh, stereotype threat and to, and to um, op uh, uh, opposition, oppositional identity. So, I want to look at this notion, both of these ideas, both, both um, stereotype threat and Agu's notion, talk about the groups maybe differing in the value that they attach to education. So do we have any evidence to support that? Um, I also want to talk about beliefs about discrimination, but that will be in study two. So these are my collaborators for this particular study. So what we did was to ask the kids to rate uh, various things. So this is their GPA. And um, it, you can, there's, there are social class differences, there are also race differences. So blacks have lower GPA, not much, than whites. But that's true even in, in, with, with social class controlled out, and even in a district where most of the African Americans are, um, uh, are middle class. Um, African American, oops. Whoops. Okay, there we go. So African American males, so this is true in many um, culture, many studies in the states are doing the most, the, the poorest, and white females are doing the best. The, this, this, the, the Aku's notion had to do with, is getting good grades acting white? So if you performed well in school, was that in fact counter to your identity as an African American? Um, and as you can see, most of the kids do not believe that. So this is yes, this is no. And what's interesting is the white kids think it's more likely that, and to the extent that they say yes to this question, the white kids say it's, it's more likely that getting good grades is acting white. The African Americans basically don't believe that. Is, good in, is, is getting good grades part of acting black? Again, from African Americans, it's about the same. Most people are saying no, the grades is not linked to these racial membership, group membership at all, but they're about, they're about the same uh, for acting white and black. Is school a priority? So what we see here is white males, and males in general see school as less of a priority, but there is no race difference. There's no difference between African Americans and European Americans. And if you ag aggregate up to a higher level scale, scale, you can see that the blacks are actually saying that academics are more important than the white European Americans do. We also gave them possible selves. Um, how many of you have used the possible sales measures? No? So you ask them, name five things you'd like to be true. These are seventh graders. Name five things you'd like to be true of you when you're in high school. And then we record those. So these are percentages. And you can see that, by and large, academic competence is the most important characteristics that they, that they will list in, when it's unsolicited. So you have to say, what do you want to be true of you in five years? Doing well in school is the most common answer that these students give in the seventh grade. And no difference based on either gender or race. Now the opposite is the fears. So uh, Hazel Marcus, when they talked about it, they said there are two ways of thinking about possible selves. One is what you hope to be true, and what you want, don't want to be true, what you fear might be true. And those two together are very motivating. So if you both want to be something, and you definitely don't want not to be that, 
that will be very powerfully motivating. And again, you can see that while academic incompetence was not the most frequently mentioned, it's right up there. It's the second most frequently mentioned for all of these kids. So they essentially want to have interpersonal competence and academic competence. So there's no evidence in this population of anything like disidentification. Now what about stereotype threat? Well, how many know you know the literature on stereotype threat? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a lab task. So what the, what the, how, how the work has gone is they will give people a test in the laboratory and they will either make salient or not mention a characteristic that they think might be related to performance. So if it's a performance on a math test, and you're a girl, they say they'll have you write your name down and check off a box saying, saying female, and you'll take the test, and you'll find that females in that condition do more poorly than females who are not asked to identify, and more poorly than males. Um, and, they've doc and they've shown this now with lots and lots of different group memberships. So if you make salient your African-Americanness and you have to take a test, you will do less well than if they didn't make that salient. So a lot of the speculation about it is through self-consciousness and anxiety. That what must be happening is when you, when you have to check off that box or identify yourself, you, that makes you anxious because you know what other people think about you. So that's the way the theory works. You know they think you're going to do less well. That potentially makes you anxious and therefore you do less well. So it's a, it's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Do we have any evidence of that? So we measured self-consciousness, and what we find is that white females are showing a lot of self-consciousness. It's mainly a gender difference within each, within each group. So in both cases, the females are reporting more self-consciousness than the males. It's not a group based on, on African-American versus European-American. Test anxiety. Again, it's more of a gender difference than it is a race difference. And what's really interesting is look at those white males. They really have no test anxiety. <laughs> or they have relatively little. They also think education is the least important and they are doing the worst of any group. So the other part of the, of, of, so, so we don't see any evidence of, at, 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 at just frequency um, ratings. But part of the theory was the extent to which if you experience, if you had, if, if you if you were experienced stereotype threat, one way to deal with it is that your self-concept in that area would be less linked to your self-esteem. That's what that's what, what what's Claude Steele called disidentification. So you would essentially say, all right, I'm not so good at that, but I don't care. So it doesn't affect my self-esteem. So that would be another way to look at it. And so these are the, this is now predicting to self-esteem using Harder's measure for global self-esteem. And what you can see is that academic self-concept does is more predictive of European-American students' self-esteem than African-Americans. And if you look at social self-concept, that's getting along with friends, the African-American self-esteem is more predictive than it is for whites. Now in the U.S., this is interesting because every, a lot of people are saying that African-American males in particular are getting a lot of self-esteem through sports. That's clearly not true here. It's actually the European Americans who are doing it. So remember that, you get those differences, but academic self-esteem is very is not a very good predictor for anybody. So here we've got, so this, this line is the extent, so what we're plotting across here is standardized beta coefficients cumulatively. So each of those is its own it, 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 its own beta. Um, this is for eighth grade male. Uh, black males, seventh grade, black males, so, so the B and the M is for race and gender, um, and the uh, grade is on the side. And as you can see, this the academic ability is not the biggest predictor for anybody. Right? Everyone agree with that? Mm -hmm. Sports doesn't matter very much. What matters is how good looking you think you are <laughs> and your relationship with your mother. <laughs> so, and as far as we know, we have no reason to assume, we have no reason to assume that there are any uh, race differences on either of those. So again, while there may be some evidence of a little bit of this effect of stereotype threat, it doesn't look like it's, ha it's having its main effect through 
uh, disidentification or self-esteem. It may be having its effect through anxiety and particularly in high, in, in high stakes testing. So not necessarily. Okay, so here were these two very popular theories. We don't get much evidence to support them. So let's go and look at some other, let's go look at some other, other data. So let's look at discrimination. So discrimination can be looked at in two ways. It can be, it can be looked at in terms of future discrimination or glass ceilings. So do you think you will have more difficulty achieving whatever goals are, high, are of high value? We were looking at achieving the education you wanted and achieving the job you wanted. Um, and that's future, and that, that's essentially future discrimination. And as you can see here, the black students, both males and females, feel like the percentage who feel like they're going to face the glass ceiling is higher than for the, than for the European American students. Now, the reason why you're getting the, the, Amer the, the European American students, students to say this is true at all is because these kids are in a district that is majority African American. So the European American students are in the minority in every high school. It ranges from 50 to 100 percent African American. So they could reasonably say, I'm going to be discriminated against. This was also, this data was collected right in the heights of affirmative action. So what you see here is the beginning of emergence of white anti-affirmative um, action. Now, these are the betas for looking at a variety of outcomes. So I just want you, I'm just showing you this so you remember it. So this is essentially the literal coefficient of perceptions of glass ceiling on change in each of these outcomes from the seventh through the end of the eighth grade. So that you can see this belief that a glass ceiling has no effect on the value they attach to school, no effect on their self-concept of academic ability, no effect on their GPA, no effect on their mental health. It does undermine white students' self-esteem. So to the extent that white students believe they're being discriminated against, will be in the future, their self-esteem drops. And it has a little bit of effect on problem behavior. And I've got lack of problem behavior and lack of negative peers. But those effects are small. Okay. Then we ask, the other way you could think about discrimination is day-to-day -day interaction. And we ask the students to give us examples in the first wave of data of how they feel discriminated against based on their race or their gender. And these are the things they told us. Get into fights with kids because of your race. Kids don't want to hang out with me. Uh, I'm not picked for certain activities because of, in this case, it was my race. Then there's classroom ones. I'm teacher calls on me less. Uh, I'm graded harder. Uh, I'm disciplined harder. I, that my teacher thinks I'm less smart, um, I'm discouraged from taking certain courses. So then the following year, we created scales out of those and asked them the extent to which they had experienced these in the last six months in school. They form very nice latent variables, two different ones that are highly correlated. I'm going to be looking mostly at them together, but you can't separate them. So these give the scales of an individual sense of being perceived discrimination based from my peers and discrimination uh, because of my teachers, in terms of my, my race. Okay, so everyone? <coughs> there, so do the kids report this? Yes, so these are, this is the, the, the ones that report having experienced these things one or more times over the last six months in the eighth grade. And you can see the blacks are reporting it at higher rates than the whites. Um, again, the whites are reporting it because, they are, because of the nature of the school that they're in. So these things come up. And this is aggregated across period. Okay, now this is the same graph showing how these perceptions of discrimination are associated with change over time in these measures of function. Of, of, of function. So if you believe you're being discriminated against, against by your race, your value for school drops, your self-concept of academic ability drops, your GPA drops, your mental health drops, if you're African American, your self-esteem drops, your, and so the way to interpret this is, you, is you, it, you have an increase in problem behavior and you have an increase in hanging around with negative peers, the, the peers that are likely to get you into trouble. Okay? So just that was what it looked like with anticipated future discrimination. This is what it looks like with these day-to-day -day experiences of discrimination. So it's clear from our data that it's these daily experiences, which are now being called microaggressions, that seem to be undermining not only academic achievement, 
but all other aspects of healthy functioning are in the adolescent years. What was the majority of um, stuff they background that was true? It was mixed, about half and half. Not majority white, it was about half and half. Okay, so now I wanted to model these effects and try to separate them out and look at some unique effects. And I'm going to add into this the perceptions and discriminations by the parents because part of what we wanted to look at was sort of the, the racial socialization that was going on in the family. So we asked the parent, we asked the parents the same two distinctions. Do you think you're, are you having more difficulty in your workplace because of discrimination? Do you think you'll be blocked for promotions? And daily hassles, daily experiences. So this is just daily experiences. This is in their community as they walk around. Do policemen pull them over? Do they get, do they get stopped? Do they get stopped in drug stores or grocery stores and things like that? So you can see that the African American parents are saying they experience this more than the white parents. And this is now a set of SEM models, and I'm going to go through them one at a time. So it's not as complicated as it looks. So if you look at perceptions, <coughs> and, and we're putting them all in at one point in time, and we're looking at change on these. So we're controlling for the prior levels of these. We're controlling for social class. We're controlling for gender. Everything you can imagine, we're controlling. So if you can look at this, what you see is that the youth's, percent, the youth's perceptions of glass ceilings actually increase the value they attach to school and increase the perception of their, of their ability, leading to higher academic achievement. So in this population, the extent to which you think you're going to be confronted with discrimination in the future increases the value you attach to school and increases your GPA. Now, I think you can imagine how this is coming down in the family. You see the same thing, you'll see the same thing when we get down to the parents, is you will face discrimination. The only power you have is to equip yourself very well educationally. So you must get as much education as you can get because that's, that's the only power that you have. Discrimination by peers lowers the value you attach to school and has no impact on your self-concept of ability. So that makes sense. I mean, you go to school, your peers discriminate against you, you come to like not going to school, knowing your, your value of that, which undermines your academic achievement, but it isn't operating through your confidence in your academic abilities. In contrast, discrimination from your teachers lowers both valuing and your self-concept of your academic abilities. Okay? Is that? If your parent feels discriminated against at work, this is more this global concept of uh, the distal process, you're going to be blocked. Again, just like with the kids, this leads to increasing the value their kids attach to school and increasing the self-concept of ability. So it actually has a positive effect on academic achievement. Whereas these discriminations, these daily discriminations in the neighborhood undermine both, have negative effects to both. So this is very important that we separate out when we talk about discrimination, whether we're talking about anticipated institutional kinds of segregation that will affect us in the future, rather than the discrimination we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, what's interesting about this, given this data, is, is there are now, and this is probably true in Australia too, there are many, many studies trying to look at the race differential in achievement. None of them will put on a question asking about discrimination. When in fact our data says when we put that in, that's the single biggest predictor. That's what is explaining it. But they don't want to put it in for a variety of political reasons. You can imagine what they would be. All right, now, we also wanted to look at identification, because I was just talking about at the beginning. What, is this, what about social identity? Let's get social identity in here. So what we did is we asked a variety of questions about what is the meaning to you of your, of, of, of your racial group membership. And I have, I can show you, we have lots and lots of measures that capture all kinds of different ways you can think about it. It turns out to be an extremely complex concept. So this is what we call a, 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 a social connect, cultural connection. 
to one's ethnic group. And it's, I have a close community of friends because of my race or ethnicity. People of my race and ethnicity have a culturally rich heritage. I have meaningful relationships because of my race and ethnicity. People of my race and ethnicity are very supportive of each other. So to endorse this, you're saying, I'm situated in a good sociocultural setting because of my race or ethnicity. We've also asked these for gender. So I'm going to now try to look and see if that plays any role. Does having that kind of belief system play any role for you? So understanding the impact of discrimination is very hard because we can't measure discrimination. We can measure perceived discrimination. There's a big debate, well, is that real? Well, how are we going to control for just the propensity to see the world as being discriminated? So we've tried to be as conservative as we can in these, in, in, in these regression equations. So we're going to be predicting to eighth grade based on characteristics from either the first wave or concurrent characteristics um, in the kids' environment in their world. So we're controlling for family and individual demographics. We're controlling for the extent to which they are already disengaged from school at wave one. And they're, already, and they're receiving discrimination at wave one. So we've got a, an initial perception of discrimination to try to control for this general, just general tendency to say people discriminate against you. We're going to put the adjustment <coughs> indicator from wave one in, so we're looking at change over time. And then we're going to look at perceived discrimination in wave two and cultural connectedness to the ethnic group. So we're going to take those characteristics from the same way as the, as the data in which we're, in which we're measuring the children's, uh, the, the adolescents' uh, uh, abilities, okay, statuses, and we're going to look at the interaction between those. So is everyone with me on the... So this is a very conservative approach because I'm already taking out of it the extent to which they really perceived they were being discriminated in the seventh grade. So to the extent that they're accurate and it's happening over time, I've actually removed that effect. So I'm only getting the extent to which they now think they're being discriminated more than they thought they were a year ago with this kind of strategy. Okay, there are graphs. So as we know, this is the prior adjustment. That's the biggest predictor that you'd expect. Discrimination, I've already talked about these effects. That was the graph that I showed you of the, of the literal coefficients. <coughs> A, a, a connection to the ethnic group, if you have a positive connection to your ethnic group, you have higher GPA. But we, what we want to do is to look at this interaction. So I'm going to show you in each case the interaction. So this is the data for GPA, which is gathered from the school. Self-esteem, which is gathered from the kids. And this is ethnic group's esteem, and that's the extent to which um, you think your, your group is proud of its existence. So it's a perception of the esteem of members of your group for being members of the group. So here we have a significant interaction. What does it look like? All right. So this is the level of perceived discrimination. This is changes in GPA. And you can see that if you have low connection, that's the group that is experiencing drops in their GPA as they feel like they're more discriminated against. This is the group that has high connection to their, to their group. No drop. So discrimination is not undermining that group of kids' GPA. Or in other language, having this sense of connected to one ethnic group, ethnic group is a protective factor in terms of GPA. What about importance attached to school, utility value of school, or our self-confidence beliefs? And this is in math, this is in school subjects. So we get the interaction for your self-concept beliefs. Again, lovely crossover effect. So if you feel like you're being discriminated against, your self-concept goes down to the extent that you're being discriminated against. So the change in self-concept self, in self over time is larger, the larger your, the larger made of discrimination you feel. But that effect is almost totally buffered by this identification with one social group. And so that's the line for the group that has high connection. That's the line for the group that has low connection. Perceived friends have positive So we ask the kids to tell us about the characteristics of their friends. And we have lots and lots of things that they can tell us. They factored in two very nice factors, which one was 
I have friends who are socially appropriate, essentially. They, they're committed to school, they go to church, they do what their parents tell them, uh, they don't get in trouble, those things. And then we have the negative, the negative characteristics, which is they get in trouble. Um, so it is all the items that have to do with they drink, they smoke, they lie to their parents, they skip school, <coughs> etc. Now, what you need to understand developmentally is in this group, the percentage of friends that have positive characteristics drops over time, and the percent of peers that have negative characteristics go up. And that's just basically the adolescent phenomenon of getting in more trouble than you go through adolescence. Sorry. Um, right here. In regards to generational discrimination, would that have an effect on that as well? Uh, I can find. I don't. I don't know. I certainly do believe that we have very negative views of adolescence in general, and that those are undermining the adolescent's attachment to the, to the larger society. I, I firmly believe that, and I've done that in other studies. I didn't test that here because these kids are all basically at the same age. So, I, so here we have the interaction is true for positive friends and for engagement, your own engagement and problem behavior. So. This is, okay, so this is, uh, as I said, this is a number of positive friends that you have, and you can see it goes down for everybody over the period of time, but this is most true for the kids who have low connection to their ethnic group. So the, 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 in, the increase in the, the decrease in the number of positive friends, proportion of positive friends in your friendship network is, is higher for the kids who have low a low connection. So what it's showing is that the more you feel discriminated against, the more you're hanging out with peers that are less connected to school over time, but that effect is buffered by this sense of social connectedness to the group. And now this is the increase in problem behavior. It goes up for everybody from over, the, over this period of time, but to a much greater extent if you're feeling dis discriminated against, and to a much greater extent if you have low connection to your social So I don't know how many of you look for interactions, but to find five interactions, all of which go in the very same direction, on indicators ranging from GPA from the school all the way to kids' reports of their involvement in risky behaviors is quite substantial. So this is, you know, this again is, uh, and no, none of the measures in the, in, in the national data sets are measuring this kind of social identity either, this connectedness to see whether it's playing or playing or not. All right. Now, so we think we have to identify that discrimination is probably, perceived, perceptions of discrimination is a major player in this disengagement, uh, withdrawal from school, um, and that it's also affecting other aspects of development during this period. But having a strong ethnic identity in terms of this feeling like you're in a, soldier, a culturally rich environment is definitely helpful this process. It gives you, and as I said at the beginning, it gives you to some extent a way of interpreting other people's behavior that is less detrimental to yourself. You can say it's their problem. It's not my problem. It's their problem. So I'm going to get on with my own goals, which are to do well in school and advance. But there's no, so now, now, so now let me switch and go to, to a more qualitative approach that we're taking. Uh, Bill Cross and other people have said there's no one way to be black, there's no one way to be any particular group. Um, so we, we asked, uh, we took, we're taking a personal orientation to ethnic identity, and um, we're trying to look for naturally occurring patterns in these, ethnic, in these ethnic identities. And we did this in a couple of ways. One way we did it with, with, with interviews with a small subset of individuals, um, and we had them talk about what it meant to them to be female, what a, a female or male, uh, African American or European American, and religion. We looked at, we asked them about all of those kinds of identities to try to get a handle for what they were, what they were thinking about. Um, and then we developed, that was part of the way we developed some of our measures. Um, so we did the qualitative interviews, and then we created items and did quantitative. So in the qualitative measures, we came up with four different identities, quite distinct identities that you could easily code for. One is what I would call nominal ethnicity, and this is an example of both. It means that my ancestors, I mean, came from Africa, and that's how deep it needs to be, because I don't really consider myself like a part of the group. So this would be a person who would check off the box, I'm African American, but is saying this, this identity really doesn't mean much to me. Now these are seventh and eighth graders, so 
and we, might, I, 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 and we have data on them later, and we haven't yet looked to see what happens this chain. But that's, that's one example. The other one is culturally embedded ethnicity. I don't associate myself with any of the stereotypes, but because of my, par because of my parents, I associate myself with the culture. So this would be an individual who wouldn't necessarily think they needed to listen to the same kind of music or wear certain kinds of clothes. They're culturally embedded. They have a cultural identity, but it isn't related to the larger, larger society stereotypes. Socio-politically embedded ethnicity, to me to be black, it means that I have to try harder and set my goals and everything, because there's always going to be a whole bunch of things in the world that are going to try to mess me up, because I'm black, or whatever. Because they feel, or some, I can't say they, because that's like a stereotype, but some people say that, hmm, that we're not equal to like people who are white. So this is a, a, a statement where clearly this, this, this individual isn't talking about their culture at all, they're talking about the socio-political embeddedness. And then we have people who have a more fully embedded perception. I've learned more about mm, what my ancestors have gone through back in the history and stuff, and we learn more about what we have to do and what we must do in order to keep the struggle alive. You know what I'm saying? To keep these things, okay, I want to be, I'm going to be like the first black woman to, you know. So this is an example of someone who's bringing into their narrative both feelings of the, what it means to be black as well as the discrimination that you're likely to experience because of it. So, we took these items and we took all the work by Robert Sellers, who's been doing, who's been trying to develop scales for measuring African American identity. And I, I think this will apply to other groups. What I'm hoping I can encourage you is to take some similar items and change the words and get and, and, and see if it works, you know, in, a, in other groups as well. So one of the things he talks about is importance. So this is really like the centrality. How important is it to you to know about your racial background? And we have we asked that item. A pride, how proud of you are you of your racial background? Connectedness, those are the items I already showed you, so cultural connectedness. And then expectations of race-based challenges. So I'm going to talk about that in terms of socio-political connectedness. So we have these four items, these four scales, and we use clustered analysis to uh, try to, to, to figure out how they fall out. So we get very nice clusters. I'm going to show you each one of them, but that's just to show you the range. We get clusters that represent all combinations of these four. And this gives you roughly, that's 67, 136, 60, 163, 69, and 104. So a substantial number of people who are in each of these different clusters. So the, the first cluster is what we call low identification. So they are relatively, these are standardized scores, so they're relatively, it's not that they're not proud, they are relatively less proud. Uh, they are relatively less important, and they are just about at the mean in terms of connectedness um, and challenges. That's 67. Non-salient, so this group has a little bit of pride, but relatively little importance, and the others are sort of right at the mean, so relative to other kids. Non-embedded identity, so these are individuals who give higher than average scores for pride and importance, but lower for connection and challenge. Moderately socio-politically embedded, so this is the group that is low on culture connections, but believes that they're going to be discriminated against in the future. This is a culturally embedded group that essentially has, has all of these characteristics, but isn't worried about being discriminated against in the future. And this is a fully embedded group. So very much like the qualitative data, we were able to identify you know, the distinct groups of, of kids representing different combinations of these beliefs. Does it matter? We created three measures of, of, of indicators of functioning. GPA, psychological adjustment, so we had all of these measures, psychological adjustment, uh, we did a superordinate um, category, uh, and they correlate into, uh, with an alpha of 0.8. Problem behaviors, we have various measures of problem behaviors. Now, one of the things I'm going to tell you, GPA is that pretty normally distributed. This is very right skewed. So this population is very mentally healthy. And this is very left skewed, meaning they're all pretty good kids. So 
So we don't have a lot of people who are at, 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 at the negative end of either of these. But how do they vary by grouping? So if you look at academic achievement, the culturally embedded and the fully embedded students have a higher GPA than students who represent the other categories. This again is like the story with the, with, with the straight quantitative data, but this is now using, you know, trying to use cluster literature. This is psychological adjustment. So here the culturally embedded youth are very highly, uh, have the highest scores, and the non-embedded have the highest scores, and the fully embedded are slightly below the mean. So this shows that there's a cost to being very much aware of the political consequences of this age group, a cost in your terms of your mental health. But put that against the fact they're all very mentally healthy. So it's relative to others, there's a bit of a cost to this. Problem behavior, you see it flip over. So those two groups that were mentally, the, that psychologically were the most positive, are now the least involved in problem behavior. And the groups that are the most involved in problem behavior are those kids who are just sociopolitically challenged, but no cultural or fully. So again, you're seeing in this full one a little bit of a cost at this age for being culturally, for, for, for being fully identified. Now, what do I think about that? That isn't what I wanted to find. I think it's weird. It's probably got some political incorrectness attached to it, so how do I interpret that? Well, you, what you need to be thinking about is what I told you first. It's relative to their peers. I'm going to go back to here, and you're going to see anger, and you're going to see getting involved in fights. What I'm going to argue, and the data seems to support it when I pull out single items, is those kids who are fully embedded are angrier. So what looks like a cost really could be just a very realistic assessment of the world that they're in. So they are saying, I don't, I'm mad about this. Whereas those who are not seeing that distant problem are not as sensitive to being angry. And as a consequence of being angry, they're likely that none of them are getting into many fights, but they're likely to be getting into arguments with their peers. So I think those costs are coming up in the extent to which they are responding realistically to an environment that is dissing them. And in which they can expect in the future to have a more difficult time. So these are, this is, a, this is in the eighth grade. I, will, I suspect that when we follow these kids forward, we're going to probably have more of the kids who are culturally embedded becoming fully identified, and they may have those that anger later, and this group may in fact be the group that fares the best as they move on to college, because they've been able to deal with some of the anger that goes along with being disenfranchised in the culture that you're reading. So, I, I, so when, I, when I run back and look at the data carefully that way, I, it again points out, we have to be very careful about how we interpret these differences. So you might have said, oh my god, this is bad. I don't think it's bad. I think it's realistic. And I think it reflects sort of appropriate levels of anger. But it'll come off, if you just look at this and don't take, it, take, that, take that into account, you'll come out and say, well, gee, those kids are on the pathway to becoming delinquents. They're not. They're righteously angry. At that point in time is what I, is, is what I would think.
So does it ring true to you? Pardon? Does this ring true to you? And yes, it does. That's great. So let's collaborate. Yes. Other comments, questions? I guess in the interviews, if you look at anything that related to like an identity crisis that was um, appearing in the identity literature, the Well, how about what you look at? Well, I don't know, that's what I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm very opposing What questions. do you want to look at, Sarah? Because <laughs> <laughs> um, it could be at that stage when you're looking at the cultural embeddedness at that age, that crisis age, if we talk about adolescence mm -hmm. and identity literature, it could, I mean, I, we'll see what happens later on with some of the participants, but perhaps. Yes, so so one of the things that, that we've looked a little bit at, and we have, we have lots and lots of questions, so one of the things that we've looked at is 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 um, the theory of negrescence, and so this is a bit like an identity crisis. I, I actually don't know how I feel about identity crises at the individual level. I think you know it's a nice term, but I don't find many kids sort of going through extreme conflict in this period. But you could imagine it happening, particularly around confronting the fact that you're that, that you're a disenfranchised, you're a member of a disenfranchised group. So negrescence talks about what you would make a person's racial identity or gender or any of these social categories, what might bring it to consciousness and make it be something you want to think a lot about and try to formulate your identity around it. I mean, again, like Erickson, I think part of this identity formation is you say, oh, I guess I better pay attention to that. And then I start paying a lot of attention to that. And I start learning everything I can. And then I form some coherent belief system around my identity. So he talks about having a, having a particularly salient discriminatory experience would be enough to sort of jog this, that's why he calls it, you know, that's why he calls it aggressance, yes. bring this to consciousness, and then you would get hypervigilance and hyperinformation processing. So we've asked those kinds of questions, and we in fact do have, from one way to another, if, it, if, it, if, if, if a young person said to me, no, I've never experienced any discrimination, when they're in the seventh grade, and by the next time we come back to them, they say, yes, I've experienced discrimination, then we're looking at that distinction. I've got a student who's looking at that distinction and seeing whether we can find evidence of, the, of a ripple effect of that in their answers of these, quali of these quantitative questions. So will we see that they then start spiking on the, on the embeddedness scales? So that would be where you might want to look for it. We ask the same thing with gender. Um, we're not getting, I mean, gender is not really very salient in this, in this population. Um, at this age, we are getting, I mean, it seems like it's the white boys that are having the most difficulty coping in this, in this group of adolescents. Um, but that's, you know, as they go through high school, the African American boys will be more likely to drop out even in this population. And we can begin to try to look at, you know, some of those, some, 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 some of those, see if we can find early predictors of who drops out, particularly drops out and is linked to their identity kinds of uh, issues. Yeah. With as you're looking at the data along the journey, can you see the development of a like a social justice self going on from what you Well we asked them a lot about that. So we have I mean this is a this is a unique data set. It turned out that in this county, I mean you know, this is where you go, oh God, thank you. Uh, in this county when these kids were in the eleventh grade, the US Million Man March occurred. Which was, a, which was a bringing together of African American men in Washington, D.C. to grapple with social justice. Uh, even though it was all, it was for men, it was actually staged out of the county in which these kids lived. And we gathered extensive information from the kids on whether they were involved and how they were involved. And then we subsequently have information of every social action group they get involved in all the way into the so yes, I can look at sort of the emergence of that um, and, and begin to pull out cases to look at the more that. What I've been trying to do is to go, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of person-centered approaches. I don't like how we're doing it. Um, I don't know the exact right way to do it. I'm doing it the way people are doing it. But I think we're, 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 we're erring in the direction of saying we want large groups which I think is an anathema to the idea of person-centered approaches. We shouldn't be looking for large groups. We should be looking for interesting groups. And they may be very small. 
but make sure that they're, but they'll be interesting. Um, so one of the things I've been trying to think about is how do you use all this quantitative data the way a qualitative researcher would use it. So you go in and read a whole case. You don't just look at each person's number compared to everyone else's number, but you take their whole packet of data over the years and you begin to study those as pieces of information. They're not interviews, but they are a lot of information. And I've got it from the kids and the parents. So we have the kids and the parents for every, all the way through high school. And you can begin to start saying, all right, now who would, how would we, there's too many of them to read each one of them. How would we, how would we pick interesting case studies to try to go into in depth and, and look at exactly what you're talking about? Because I've got a um, whole study and there is salience between, because it's matched in gender, and there is the Aboriginal girls who are more culturally embedded in Aboriginal culture are more, have a more social justice intention as compared to the males. But it's small scale, so I can't make Well, I, I, I suspect we would find that, in, that as well. In that it was in part, I mean, what we're finding is that, the, is that for many of the boys, it leads to not social justice, but alienation. And I don't know whether that would be true here or not, but, the, but we're, we are seeing some evidence that the girls will try to go in and will try to use it to produce positive change, whereas the boys will be more like, just in, what the sex difference is, there's some of each in both groups, but to the extent that there's a sex difference, it would go along with what you're saying you're finding in your small. It also depends on if they've grown up in another community. Yeah, absolutely. We are much more stronger identified this is from the person growing up in another community and being connected to six other communities, we are much more stronger in our cultural identity. Yep. So, more like a whole. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I, I think all of this just that just cries out to be looked at in terms of the larger socio, you know, context, the ecology that you're in. And clearly, the more you're embedded within a system where your, your group membership and your history is made salient, the more likely these identity processes are to, are to happen. Um, just the, oh, this one is just, um, I was just thinking um, about some of the gender differences in girls and women and wanting them to do things with their lives that make more of a social contribution. And I would have been interested to know if she had anything about sort of self-interest um, for the boys. Uh, but, and the men, because it might be that the girls, you know, they get more switched on to social justice, help help our community. And the boys get all switched on to how am I going to navigate this? Yeah. And, yeah. and we can look at that. That that's it's not Aboriginal, but we can certainly look at that the states. And I would love to do comparisons with since we have these data, do comparisons with, with um, groups here in Australia. I haven't done it with Native Americans in the U.S. I think they are probably harder to actually study than Aboriginals are here. I don't know why I believe that's true, but uh, they're, 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 they're not many, so they're a very, very small part of the population, and they're spread all over the United States. So it's hard to find a, a, a place where you can go and study them as much, but uh, that can be totally wrong. But you also have other groups too that are being discriminated against, not just Aboriginals, but other populations as well. But maybe perhaps more analogous to our Hispanic populations. Um, I can take you to a nice place with flag staff, with men with the garbage. You yes. promised to take me to the reservation. Yes, that, that is the reservation. So yeah, not all, not, not we can go there. Place to go. See, I've got the beads. Protect me from evil, that means this lot. <laughs> Hard work. Um, thank you all for coming today. Can you, uh, and Jack, look, that was fantastic. I mean, it gives us so many insights into what's going on in the research overseas and so many exciting leads um, for our research. Um, here, I'm thinking the Indigenous program. For starters, I mean, there's about 20 studies there I've already written down notes on, um, as well as some of the work that we're doing with the Northern Territory Police Force. We're actually in the middle of negotiating a contract. I haven't got it signed yet, people, so don't go out there and tell everyone that yet. But we're in the middle of getting a contract signed, and it's actually about looking at um, institutionalised racism 
um, in the Northern Territory, which is um, very, very a very important area to look at because there's uh, violence and murders in the Northern <coughs> Territory, particularly of young people, and uh, many of them have not been properly addressed because of institutionalised racism. Um, and it's something that needs to be addressed in Australia. Um, so that's another area that we're looking at. And this research just gives you know, so many ideas on how we can investigate that. And I think it's time for me to return to my sick bed now. And I hope I haven't given it to any of you. I'm trying to keep away from all of you today. But can you join me in thanking Jackie?